I want to throw initially everything at this and see what are things that are changing that we can monitor. So you always have to have one primary effectiveness, and I think for me that would have to be uh, probably at the MSFC with a different cognitive component to it, or an additional cognitive component. Now, so so in, fatigue? No, uh, uh, it's a multi-source functional composite. Okay. So you have an upper extremity motor, mm -hmm. lower extremity motor, and a couple cognitive. Okay. to Because I think that we tend to believe from our initial observational experience that the cognitive, the global, the constitutional, the generalizable symptoms are ones that really tend to respond more immediately and more dramatically than some of the localizing or, or particular symptoms involved in extremity. So the secondary evaluations beyond that primary is where the money is. We want to look at all sorts of different things, throw the whole kitchen sink at this from cerebral perfusion to flow phasicity in the jugular veins to ocular coherence tomography to quality of life to everything that we can. And that will help us then forge the real larger trials that may be multi-center mm -hmm. or even societal based that will actually have some direction mm -hmm. and focus of these are the real parameters so mm -hmm. we get down to those one or two things okay. that you'd like. What we would like to do is initially uh, do a pilot, again, uh, maybe somewhere around 20 patients with three-month follow-up. And again, in three months, everyone who is in the, the what we'd call a sham mm -hmm. or the actual non-treatment okay. arm would then get a, a chance to cross over. Mm -hmm. By ensuring people that they do get that cross, then you don't have uh, the potential bias or tendency that the patients may want to intentionally underperform just to make sure that they're going to get treatment. Because MS mm -hmm. patients always want more. <laughs> there's got to be, I want more, I want more. Mm -hmm. And if there's a chance that they might by virtue of scoring very highly on something, not be eligible to get the treatment, they will intentionally score lower mm -hmm. so that they will ensure they get the treatment. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to make sure that they're aware that they, anyone who enters it will get treated. Mm -hmm. Then we can take that data and go to a larger study. Mm -hmm. And again, we want to follow people, of course, in six months, at nine months, at 12 months, mm -hmm. but keep that primary endpoint short. Mm -hmm. And then we can really actually see what number of patients do have a re-narrowing mm -hmm. from the angioplasty, what other potential endovascular options are there from stents to other things that might give us a more durable okay. result. If we could come up with a set of answers over a short period of time, three months seems a little too short, I would love to get there in that, but let's say six months to within a year of having recruitment of an XYZ number of patients. And the reason that becomes important is because even if you start a trial today in time, by the time the process enrolls, the number of patients that are needed, that process can go on for six months. Mm -hmm. The study doesn't end at six months. You have to meet endpoints at six months or one year down the road. So the study really ends at that point. Mm -hmm. And that's why Mike's point is so valid in trying to design studies that are not looking at five-year patency rates or outcomes because the reality is my MS patients don't care about five years. They want to know how this impacts them today, tomorrow, and in their day-to-day -day living. And we certainly appreciate that because we need to understand MS patients' needs from that standpoint. Most MS patients are certainly aware that drug trials have a sponsor that's usually a pharmaceutical mm -hmm. manufacturer and that it's sort of a business. In this case, it's different. And I think probably most of the audience does understand that these endovascular trials, there is not a single company that I think companies are interested, but they don't yet see the business mm -hmm. opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. So for the current near future, as we start doing all these little trials that hopefully better prepare us to understand what we need to measure, mm -hmm. and in the future, how durable and why certain patients respond and others don't, yeah. and further understanding that as we move towards larger trials that may indeed have sponsors, yeah. in this early phase, how do we pay for it? Well, the choices are, you know, government grants, societal grants, uh, uh, insurance, mm -hmm. there's a code for venous compression, mm -hmm. obviously, that uh, uh, is something that some people will get pre-authorized for and pay for. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Medicare is not really something that we talk about in the MS population yeah. unless they're far advanced, so that's out. And so what we're really left with is then trying to get donations together to fund trials, if, especially when you're using this randomized sham blinded arm. Right. It's very difficult to to uh, not to not to not be able to have patients know what another patient's getting if someone's getting a bill and the person who got the sham is not getting a bill. You That's know, right. MS patients network extremely well and they'll know. So it, it really you can't have that in there. Cost has to somehow be dealt with up front. And if you do are lucky enough to have the financial backing from donations, et cetera, to do a trial, and it obviously can't be a large trial, but a trial to set forth how you might move towards a large trial and an application to a sponsor like the NIH or mm -hmm. something like that. It's very critical that we, uh, that these patients not really have too much out-of-pocket expense. Okay. And I think people are aware of that, and I think MS patients are aware of this. It's something that is, is kind of awkward and uncomfortable to speak about, but I think it is very different from the standard yeah, drug yeah, trial. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult for us physicians to even question asking for patients to uh, pay for studies or uh, pay for procedures that have shown validity and to really be in a place where this is not a place where any one of us like to be in in focusing on a therapy that has or has a potential of good or great benefit, mm -hmm. yet having no funding or minimal funding available for mm -hmm. this. Not having enough data to tell patients that they truly will have a benefit, yet having to charge the patients. Um, I, I think that is a very uh, slippery slope and a bad place for all of us to be caught in. I think uh, I would encourage anybody who's watching this uh, to look at valid trials that are ongoing in the United States. Look at people who have done this for a long time and who have good outcomes that they might measure from this. And, and you know, one such way is obviously the randomized trials that you and I are in the process of uh, evolving and, and working with. And, and, and buy into that there's a contribution to this that is really needed. We have a lot of data today on surgical reconstruction of veins. Now that's a much more invasive procedure uh, and it certainly could be daunting as you talk mm -hmm. to patients about that mm -hmm. right off the bat and we don't have enough evidence to say let's just do surgery on everybody with MS to see if this would have um, a lot of value. But I think in extrapolating from angioplasty data to angioplasty and stenting anecdotal experience to hundreds of patients experience that's going to emerge from Europe and across the world, mm -hmm. it kind of becomes important to have an arm to this that not just measures adequate outcomes, but that also looks at histological data. Why is it that these veins at certain places are getting stenosed? You know, there's no great way of understanding that unless until you had a piece of specimen in your hand. Uh, so I think that analysis over time will also become important. Uh, and the other components are really, is there a minimally invasive surgical arm to this entire piece? We know that in general when we talk about venous reconstructions, we measure surgical revascularization in three to five year blocks and five to ten year blocks. Uh, there are patients that don't necessarily do well with venous bypass, but there are patients who do really well with venous bypass, especially that are short segment, especially when you just transpose veins, not that you need long segments of venous reconstructions. And the jugular veins predispose you to having that as an armamentarium. Now we're not there yet. We're not talking about surgical revascularization. What we're talking about is getting some hard evidence endpoints that let us go from identifying lesions to treating them minimally invasively, to figuring out whether this works and then getting there. I think most promising is that there seems to be a crescendo of interest on multiple levels. I mean, this is, I mean, if you sort of live through this, it seems like the tempo is a little slow and the cadence is kind of syncopated, but in reality, it really is growing. And, and just the fact that that many societies are devoting time on their annual meetings, whole you know blocks of time to discussion of this, has really come fast. I mean, from an initial 
awareness and introduction a year ago to now, for example, at my Society of Interventional Radiology having basically categorical courses on something, that's coming fast, okay? So that's very exciting. And I, I, I also think that that the opportunity to work with people from different disciplines, to come at this from different angles, to look at different facets, we're just breaking a lot of things open, not just MS, but the whole idea of looking at veins and how flows work and what's pathological and what's not. I mean, we I think we're really in sort of the still Neanderthal primitive age, but the fact we started. And so it is step by step by step, illuminating the next step, but it's, it's really exciting. What we see today as a central venous stenosis is one element of a big picture. Will it have all the answers? Probably not. MS is very complex. But I think it will have a major answer or a pivotal changing in direction from how we will manage MS patients. Uh, the energy that's been behind it has been really uh, amazing to me and, and I think we are just getting started.